Speaking of headphones and awkwardness, you know, did you see I was on Comic Book Bears this past week, the Star Wars special? I did see that, yeah. Well, I didn't know we were we were going to record live until that day, and I don't have a camera or uh, headphones for my computer. Oh, no. So, yeah, so I literally used Velcro and taped my cell phone to my monitor. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that was the best I could do. And then I started having technical difficulties and had to drop out of it with about not only that, but it in because it was video on my cell phone, even though I started with a full battery, it killed my battery. In oh, yeah, hours. it drains it fast. Yeah. I'm freaking tired. I'm pretty tired. I uh, was out uh, blowing leaves in my lawn yesterday. I realized I got about a week to get all of the leaves to the street, and I don't think it's going to happen. Uh oh. Yep. I I've got to rake my yard at some point. That's it's on my to do list, but it's one of those things. Just like fuck, I don't want to do it ever. You can borrow uh, my blower after this week. I may may take you up on that. Yeah. Um, it makes it a whole lot easier. Nothing says friendship like letting a buddy borrow a blow. Or <laughs> <laughs> Well, while we're not out doing uh, the yard work and stuff, um, because we don't want to, um, and, and you know what makes a really good excuse for not doing those things is recording a podcast with your friends. Yeah. It does. Probably the most commonly used excuse. If for not, not doing yard, yard work. It's yeah, gotta that, be up there, right? Rain. Rain is the is the other big one, which is helping me out a whole bunch today. <laughs> Honey, you gonna go you gonna go rake <laughs> leaves? No, no, baby, I've got I've got podcasting afoot. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. um, yep. <laughs> these are important things. We are we are we are tracking history with our voices. We are adding to the collective zeitgeist of pop culture by recording a show that a lot of good people are going to listen to. Hey, everybody, welcome to episode 161 of the Southern Fried Geekery podcast. Uh, if you recognize the voice, you know who I am. I'm Caleb Alexander McKenzie. Matt Trogdon. And I'm Craig Lance. And it is good to be back. Like I said, it's been a long week. Uh, I'm a little bit tired, um, but that's okay. It's been a, it's been a good week. Um, I feel, uh, you know, on some level refreshed. Like I, there, there, there are probably multiple reasons for that, but it's nice to wake up in a good mood for the first time in a few years um but that's neither here nor there um how are you guys doing this week i'm doing okay (laughs) it's been always (laughs) always like hearing the answer to that question from craig it's never oh man i'm good it's oh gosh uh you know it could be worse. <laughs> tired, achy. Let, let stuff, yeah, stub my let, toe let me, on the way in here. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, do you want me to lie? I'll start lying. Everything's great. <laughs> Things are perfect. Hey, look, sometimes okay is okay. That's fine. All right. All right. How can you? How can a man wearing a beret be anything but fabulous? That's the question. You know that I'm wearing a beret, unless you've got a secret Facebook. Uh, you're, I'm looking at your profile pic on our Zoom call, and you are rocking a beret like you were born. Mine, on mine, it has me and my dog. Oh wow! Yes, yeah, so, I'm seeing here. Yeah, I've got the one with with Craig and Apollo too. So apparently, um, apparently Matt has a, a picture of Craig saved that that we didn't know about. I don't. I wonder, that's weird. <laughs> Dude, technology this, is weird. Um, but, you know, it's not. not so we're berets. Weird. Craig rocks hey, the beret, I, got the, I, I got that beret when I was in Paris, and that picture was taken in Paris. So. Craig Craig wears a mean beret. It looks good on him. He can pull it off. It yeah, is. he's killing it. Killing it. I wear a raspberry else. beret. Yeah. Now that's going to be stuck in my head for the rest episode. <laughs> Matt, how are you doing this week? <laughs> Oh man, I'm good. Yeah, I'm solid, man. But are but are you really? deserve definitely? Are you really good? Or are you just oh, saying man, that because you think it's what man. we want to hear? Dude, good. Capital G. Good. <laughs> good. <laughs> exclamation point! Exclamation. That's right. Exclamation. That's right. 
Uh, you guys are silly. Um, all right. Well, let's let's get this let let's get this moving along. We got comics to talk about, and we've got somebody to talk to. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about some something we read this week, and then we're gonna roll in. We're gonna get a friend on the line to tell us about a new artistic endeavor that he he and some of his friends and some folks that if you're in indie comic circles, you 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 probably know uh, you you may know about. We've we've spoken about one or two of them on the show before, as a matter of fact. Um, but we're gonna bury that lead, and you're gonna have to stick around and find out who that is. Because um, why wouldn't you? You want to, you know, you do. Um, so. As always, when we read our comics throughout the week, we try to find at least three things that we we enjoyed that we thought were, you know, maybe, maybe even if we didn't enjoy them, maybe we thought, huh, I should mention this on the show. So and we call that our short stacks because, you know, we're Southern and we like equating things to breakfast foods like pancakes because um, if you have pancakes, you have bacon and only good things happen when you have bacon. So we'll start with Craig this week. Uh, and I think we're going to have some overlap which is always fun. So what got served up on your short stack this week, Craig? Yeah, we're definitely going to have some over overlap this week because this month has been a slow month for comics, but uh, I read Immortal Hulk number 42, Al Ewing and Joe Bennett. Um, you know, as per usual, they kill it. The last page is just absolutely amazing. Joe Bennett's art continues to just be horrific and wonderful. And when I say horrific, I mean in the best possible way. Beautifully grotesque. Uh, yes. I read Iron Fist number one by Larry Hama and David Wachter. This was a, an outstanding book. A, and what I loved is that they didn't go back and try and give me like a history of Iron Fist. They just picked up like, you know, who the hell the character is. And I kind of enjoy that. Darth Vader number nine by Greg Pak and Raphael Ayinko. Uh, this story continues to be really good if you're even though it takes place between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi it's actually tying into the sequel series so you should go out and read it them do be facts though them do be facts um, yeah yeah I mean, I'm not gonna, but I appreciate that that, that, that you want me to. Oh, man. Uh, Matt, what's Probably on your most short stack? awkward man? transition of short stacks ever. Oh, God. That was, that was amazing. So my short stack, I read Maestro uh, War and Pax, number one. Uh, Peter David's writing this issue uh, series as well as he did the last Maestro series. Arts by Javier Pena and Jesus uh, Albertov. Really digging this, man. Really digging this. And the pencils in this, Javier Pena's pencils are really freaking good. Last page, so happy about the last page. I'm stoked to see how, no spoilers, Peter David writes that character that he revealed on the last page. Mm -hmm. I also picked up Space Bastards, number one. Uh, this is in the. This is from Humanoids Press. I picked this up because Derek Robertson did the art on it, and I'm a huge fan of his. The writers are Eric Peterson and Joe Aubrey. It's a fun sci-fi crime-ish story. Of course, Derek Robertson does what he always does on art, and just really kicks the the uh, compelling nature of the story up quite a bit. Um, Something very interesting of note, if you read the back matter, I'm guessing either one of you guys read this. I didn't. No, no I, grab it. I did not. So the back matter describes how this comic came together. Uh, this is it's hard to believe this actually happened, but basically the writers have been trying to get this story put together as a short film, yada, 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 throughout the years, decided they were going to make a comic of it, couldn't find an artist they wanted decide to go hiking around the Grand Canyon, get drunk, got lost, and had to be rescued via helicopter. The person flying the helicopter was a volunteer, Derek Robertson. Seriously? And that's how they got him on the art for this book. That is crazy. Is that not amazing? It, it amazing? really is. First off, so, of course, Derek Robertson flies helicopters in his spare time because he's Derek Robinson. Yeah, they, he was like, he showed up wearing a cowboy hat and a denim shirt. Derek Robertson just rescued them from certain death. 
stranded it near the Grand Canyon. I mean, it's amazing. This what? So anyway, yeah, that was the most that was the biggest deal about the book to, for me. Thirdly, I read from Marvel. I read one of these True Believer reprints that I read a lot. This is the Invincible Iron Man uh, number one forty nine. What's note of note of this? The <clears throat> the plot and the writing is done by David Michelin, who was very, very prevalent at the time. Mm -hmm. John Romita Jr. did the art. John Romita Jr.'s art in this book is freaking amazing. I forget how good, uh, <laughs> he, well, I'll just say it was. Uh, how much I really <laughs> Yeah. Him. I mean, go back and look at this old art of his. It's freaking, he kills I, it. It's so I good. Agree. If he had but, never done creator-owned stuff, we would have still had a great artist. Oh, it was amazing. Um, it really makes you think what, you know, there's some really funny panels in here too, by the way, like Iron Man is guarding a dock and, you know, he's just sitting on the dock. Lean, he's just sitting on the dunk like a bum. Just waiting just to, to, when he's guarding the dock. Nothing dramatic. He's not flying around, scanning for life. Nothing. He's just sitting there, which I thought was hilarious. But uh, yeah, this, this was a really fun read. It was really good. Dr. Doom shows up. He's written amazingly well. Again, I cannot brag about the art enough. It really, you know, when you go back and look at the timeline real quick on this and John Romita Jr.'s art changing, I can't help but feel that he felt threatened by the 90s boom and the, and the dramatic artists that were blowing up at the time and felt like he had to do something different to right. stay relevant that's the uh, that's the only thing i can think of because i went back and looked at the timeline and it's when an art started to change and that's when it did yeah hmm. and and i think that in more recent years he started doing more um more digital and playing around with digital tools and that's really affected um affected so the, yeah, what, he, what he does i felt like a lot of the change happened when he uh did uh kick ass yeah it seems like all of his characters are drawn in that same style since he did kick ass. I can see that too. Yeah, I don't disagree. I I, I personally prefer old JR JR to uh to his more current output. Um and that but I mean that's just it's one of those things. It happens. Well, if you go back and look and when he took over titles from the, you know, all the image guys leaving, that's when you really see it start to make that swing into what, you know, you're referring to as his kick ass art. Yeah. Well, um, I too, like Mr. Craig Lance, read Iron Fist, Heart of the Dragon. And, and I know for, you know, Matt spoke about this last week as his book to pick up. But, um, and for most people, Larry Hama is going to be the pull on, on this book. But for me, Dave Walker is the reason to pick this book up. Um, his art in this, in this book is just, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. Like, I, I don't know how else to put it. It's stunning. It's, you know, if you are not familiar with, with the work that he did on his long tenure on TMNT, which, you know, I'm not a Ninja Turtles fan. So I picked up a few issues here and there just for his art, but uh, it's so good. It's so dynamic. Um, and look, I don't know if he's going to listen to our show or not. Well, we'll just assume he is because most people of, of import and notes listen to our show. Um, presidents, Kings, whatnot. Um, but I call dibs on the hide and seek page. I, I want that page real bad in my life. I'm not going to tell you who's on it, but there is probably the most adorable, wholesome game of hide and seek um, that has ever been played. And I, and I want to own that page. Um, second on ye old short stack is I read the, the final issue of a book that was on my, my brother Craig's top 10 list this uh, of 2020. And that is The Red Mother by Jeremy Hahn, Danny Luckert, uh, comes out of Boom Studios. It was a great ending to a great series. Um, just, again, uh, one of those team-ups that they just played off of each other really well. Um, and it's it's it, I kind of like that they left the door cracked open a little bit. You know, they, they left the potential to revisit this world in some sense. So uh who knows who knows if they ever will um and then last but certainly not least is the issue four of a image top cow book that um i've been kind of on the fence about but i think this this issue really locked it in and said okay um you're gonna keep reading this and that is uh issue four of a man among ye um 
Stephanie Phillips, Craig Cermak, John Kalentz, and Troy uh, Pateri are working on this book. And it's it's a pirate book. And it takes, uh, if you know much about pirate history or if you've seen um, the show Black Sails, it pulls from those uh, those same characters. And Bonnie, um, you know, is, is kind of the main focal point of the character. It focuses on the two most legendary female pirates ever. Um, and I say the reason I was on the, I was on the fence and, and the reason, the reason because up until this issue, it, it felt like it could have been just something that happens between the scenes of, of black sales. And, you know, from my opinion, for as little of its worth, it started to feel like maybe it was just kind of derivative, but the, the issue took a turn in this and it took it off in a different direction to something that's really going to solidify it as its own, own story um I, I dig the art i like pirates I, what's not to like uh so go check out a man among ye i, I seriously think stephanie phillips and I, I said this on the show um about one of her other books last week but I, I think she has had one of the biggest um biggest years of any quote unquote new creator i have no idea how long she's been in the game but i hadn't seen her name before this year and all of a sudden she's on like three books that i'm reading so um really really great year really really great moment of comeuppance for for this uh young woman uh comics writer so dope love it love to see it um yeah are any either one of you reading this book uh, i'm not i am i'm one i have not read this last week's issue yet though nice i'm curious to see what you think about it so yeah. um it was a light week in comics like craig said this this whole month has been there, there hadn't been a ton of output, especially at least in like new series. Um, there, there hadn't been a whole lot started. And so um, each week on the show, we try to get together and do a round table. Uh, and, and that's, we, we all try to read a book that either starts off a new arc or it's, it's just a new number one um, to, to, to kind of talk about. And, you know, like I said, uh, Maestro War and Pax number one had came out, uh, True Space Bastards had came out, um, immortal uh, iron fist heart of the dragon came out and they all started a new series uh but we we got together and there was a book that we had planned on talking about beforehand that we uh, you know we before last that we had never really gotten to um that it starts off a new series and it's one that again i think matt chose this as a book to to pick up for a new comics book they pick um which by the way a man's recommendations are solid if you're not taking them up on it you, you need to need to fix your life you're not living right um, but thank book, you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. See, see, I, I give us, um, I'll take it away later. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that Definitely. book is <laughs> none other than, um, a new series from, from image comics that came out and it's, it's written by a, a, you know, a, a person that wrote one of my favorite stories of last year. It's written by W Maxwell Prince. It's got art by the great Vanessa Del Rey colors by Chris O'Halloran. Letters by Good Old Neon. Literally, that's that's what they call themselves, Good Old Neon. Um, and there was a variant cover that, that actually is the one that I picked up. Um, that is by Nimitz uh, Malavia. Um, and well, the the story was about a clown, <laughs> without saying anything else. And before we get too much into it, I will say, new book you might not have read it. Um, there's no real way to talk about a comic uh, in detail without spoiling a few things. So here's a spoiler warning. Check the show notes if you don't if you want to see where we we pick up uh, on something else without ruining it for yourself. Um, but there you go. Now you can't get mad at us. So I'm, I'm curious what you guys thought about Ha Ha Number One. Uh, just on the, you know, give me the the quick and dirty of your opinion. I like the book. Um, it was interesting. The art was good. The I'll be whenever we're done talking about it. I'm looking forward to hearing what your each one of you took away from this book. Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed it too. Um, it, it as Matt said, I enjoyed the art a whole lot. I, the ending kind of hooked me a little bit, but uh, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a pretty good book. I. I, okay, so I love the book, and I'm going to keep reading it. I had a really hard time reading this book. Um, full disclosure, it's some behind-the-scenes stuff. I'm straight-up chlorophobic, which means I have a irrational, unnecessary, totally not explainable fear of clowns. Like, I, I hate them. Like, they, the, the minute I see a clown, like, like it, and not like an it clown, so scary clowns don't bother me. The minute I see a happy clown, my flight or fight 
trigger uh, is or like response is triggered. And, and so literally I had to fight to make it through this book. But uh, it was one of those things after I closed the last page, you know, number one, I was like, oh, that was that was neat. And it's weird. And I liked it. But also I did this. I kind of faced a fear kind of thing. Um, so, so that's my uh, experience with this book. Um, I, I wonder if there's any other phobias that people have that um, are visual cue phobias that ever the trick. And I realized like, I'm, I'm not joking. Like, and, and I think Craig can attest to this. Like I have an irrational fear of clowns. I, 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 I don't go in places that there are, there are clowns and this book centers a clown. Uh, it, it is, it is front and uh, foremost in this book. Um, because the the story is about you know it, it's about the man under the the makeup right it's it's about this um this gentleman who makes his living at an amusement park uh at, he he is a professional clown he he works at this place called oh what's it called like uh fundville um and they have roller coasters and people making balloon animals there's an arcade um it's very kind of like i don't know if anybody outside of our little our region will, will know this but it's kind of like um, Dog Patch USA, a little bit, uh, maybe Silver Dollar City, uh, if that makes sense. But you know, that's what he does. That's how he feeds his family. Um, but things aren't going well. Um, and 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 Bart, this man, is, you know, he's struggling to pay his bills. The 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 the, the park is about to shutter its doors. His wife's about to leave him and take the kids. Like. Literally, the, the, the man is is having a bad day. It, the whole thing reminds me of that joke from Watchmen, honestly, um, you know, where the guy goes to the therapist and the therapist says, oh, you need to go see, um, I think it was Pagalachi the, the Clown. And the guy says, but, you know, I am Pagalachi the Clown or whatever his name was. So the, the book kind of takes on that that whole tone. Um, and, and he goes to work and he doesn't realize when he's going to work, it's going to be his last day there. Um, he gets his, his final check. Um, everybody gets laid off. They, the, 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 they just decided to just cut the cord on the park. Um, and you know, he, he's, he walks out to his car and, you know, these are all folks who, who are making it on minimum wage. They're already struggling to survive. And, and now things have gotten cutthroat. So as he's walking out to the car, he's assaulted by a friend who takes his wallet, but luckily he had the, the wherewithal to, you know, hide some money. Um, so, you know, like a, one day made worse. So he, he goes from there and he's going to go take his paycheck that he, that he hid in his sock and he's going to go put it in his bank account. He's going to try to pay a few bills with it, you know, just to hold him over until he can make, you know, till he can find a new job. And of course, you know, bad day gone worse. He walks in the bank and the bank is being robbed by these little trio of, um, you know, ne'er do wells who have got machine guns and, and pistols and, and they're there to take all the money and they tell everybody to, you know, get down on the floor and they're, they're wearing these weird little baby masks. Um, and, and my man kind of breaks a little bit, like he's just kind of done. Um, <laughs> he, he, the, this is the, the, the bridge too far, the straw that, that broke the camel's back. And he just, you know, when the, when the guys are telling him to get on the ground, he's just like, yeah, I prefer not to, but no, if you don't get on the ground, I'll kill you. Eh, I prefer not to um, just, I mean, he's literally asking to be killed. Like, I think he just, he's, he's, in a way he's trying to, you know, and, and trigger warning, but he's trying to commit suicide by having one of these people just off him. Like he's just done. Um, and they oblige, like, they're like, okay, yeah, you want this? Cool. Um, and so they put a bullet in his head. Um, somehow by the miracle of whatever clown deity, um, this, this man worships, the bullet is a through and through it goes through the two, uh, it goes right through the crevice of his brain. It goes through the lobes, comes out the other side. Um, somehow mainly by plot armor um he survives this and he goes to the doctor and they're like yeah like we're gonna yeah, I'll, I'll, number one this man needs to call an attorney because malpractice was committed and they because they let him go home um after he gets out of the hospital but after he he gets shot in the head he, he wakes up and these guys are still robbing the bank and and somehow he uses his um clown powers <laughs> and his bag of tricks to really just beat the shit out of all of these bank robbers while, while they're attempting to, to rob this bank. Um, and so, yeah, it goes to the doctor, they treat him, they send him on his merry way. Again, malpractice suit. You don't just send somebody who got shot in the head home. Um, but as he's going home, his, the things that he's seeing is starting to change and the shapes of people 
are starting to turn into like balloon animals. Uh, like, like obviously there's been a side effect. Obviously there's been something going on. Um, and, and as he goes at the end of the book, he goes to walk into the house and he's literally out of his mind. Um, and he's, yeah, he's seeing things that aren't as reality should see them. He's really maybe for the first time seeing the world through the eyes of a clown. Um, and of course his wife is like, you know, come inside. We can't let folks see you, you know, with your head all bandaged up. Let's, let's, you know, you're going to embarrass us in front of the neighbors. Um, so she ushers him inside. Uh, I think this is a really great story and it's really, um, you know, once I can put the book down and not have to stare at a clown, um, giving me actual goosebumps in real life, um, W. Maxwell Prince writes these type of weird, borderline psychedelic stories. Uh, he he did the same thing in um, uh, the the town called Nowhere um, that that he wrote last year, which was I thought was a phenomenal story. Um, and and I actually that's the one I was telling you guys I own a piece of the, the art um, from um, Tyler Jenkins and uh, that that did the art on that book. But it's he writes these stories that are visually uh, motivated. It really, it really showcases the relationship between a writer and the artist and the tone that you're putting off. Um, because it's like I said, stylistically, it just shifts. And, and he's done enough of these books to like this, that it just tells me like, this is something that he envisioned in his mind. And he, he has either the, the good fortune or the wherewithal to work with really, really talented artists, um, who do things a little bit differently than what you see in, in your average everyday comic. And I've seen Vanessa Del Rey's work before, like, and I've seen her, you know, she's done some work for the big two. She did some of the Scarlet Witch books, um, or at least some of the pages from one of the Scarlet Witch series. Um, and she's no slouch. She can, she can shift um, gears in a heartbeat and go a completely different direction. And she did that um, in this book, but, but W. Maxwell Prince can also do this thing where he takes in, like real life struggles from every day, things that you and I deal with, you know, the economic inequity. Um, and he's able to, to morph them into a abnormal story. And I don't know how else to put that, but there, it, it is an, he, he takes struggles that, that are every man's struggles and he, he puts them into absurdist situations. Um, and I'm really drawn to that. I mean, you guys know me. I like it when people take chances, um, in books, I like it when they they go places that aren't necessarily easy to go to, even if it doesn't work. Um, I, I tend to respect when they they take those leaps. So that's just that's just my opinion on this book. Like I can't um, I can't wait to see what he does next. Uh, I can't wait for issue two. I really have um, thoughts about well, not thoughts, but I, I I'm not sure how much of this book really took place and how much of it took place in Dean's head. And that, yeah, based on the writer, you know, um, I would say we're going to have to wait for another issue to know what uh, which parts of this book are rea- are based in reality and which ones are not. Well, you're probably not going to get that because <clears throat> this book was solicited as each issue is an independent story. Really? Oh, okay. So he's doing the ice man mm. cream kind of thing, or ice cream man yeah. kind of thing. Okay. Mm. Um, interesting. Uh, I hope uh, not. Um, yeah, the, I, I'm going to. I'm going to be. I, I don't know. I can't say that I won't like it until I get the next issue. But I, I, yeah, I kind of hope it's not that. Like, I don't feel like we got enough to know what. Like, I want to know what happens next. And, and maybe that's the point. Maybe maybe it's the writer saying, "Hey." You know, you don't need to. Um, and if that's the case, then then you have to go back and revisit this story to really unpack it, because apparently the writer in, in their conception thinks that that this is the full thing and is just leaving it incredibly open ended. Um, well, the re- the question becomes, were his family always uh, balloon animals or not? Yeah. Or, or, you know, did did he actually survive getting shot in the head? Um, is this some type of weird afterlife purgatory? Um, is this his spirit going on? And is he just kind of stuck in this weird loop? Um, it, you know, I don't know, like that, that changes, like knowing that absolutely changes how you have to conceive this book. Um, but Craig, it's interesting that you said that about this, that you, 
it's really hard to tell whether or not this is what parts of this book are reality and what parts are fantasy, because that was the, that was the same thing in King of Nowhere that, that I thought was so brilliant about that, um, about that series is he, like every, like he would get you close to thinking, oh, okay, this really is just an alternate universe. He stepped into, then something else would happen. And you're like, oh no, maybe he really is just in a weird drug induced, like psycho uh, break that he's having. And by the end of the book, like he, the book has an absolute concrete conclusion and you still don't know what is real and what is not. Um, and I think that, that, you know, in and of, you know, I always overanalyze these things, right? Like, and you guys make fun of me for it as you, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I always look for some type of message that, you know, and in some books, it's not there in some books, it is that the writer's trying to convey. And, and I think on some level, there's a, there's a statement about, you know, real life um and and what i think the statement is that uh most people that are that are clowns for a living are broken people i think that's the (laughs) statement of this book (laughs) you know i mean to me i mean what i took from this this it's like i don't know it really had the feeling to me like the um uh, the line between um positive thinking and self-delusion is very thin right uh you know this guy is a complete failure um as a adult as a family man and he essentially just is not going he just has been refusing to acknowledge it to improve his situation you're you're assuming he's actually a family man though yeah well, I mean, I think you have to, I mean, that's the setting of whether that's quote unquote real or not. I mean, that is the setting yeah. of the story to, to give gravity to a situation. I mean, that and, is true. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, that's what I took away from this book is just that very thin line between delusion and positive thinking. Yeah. And I mean, like, like, not that you should change up. I mean, you, I, I don't really think you can change up anything, but uh, take the same framework of the book and ha- have it not be a clown. Have it be a factory worker. Have it be a dude that goes to a place that just continue. It's very mundane work. It's the same thing every day. It's not nearly as colorful. Um, it doesn't have the aspects of, oh, people go there to have fun. It's just a, a kind of an everyday job um, for a low pay uh, that, that your job is always on the line on some level and it goes bottom up. Um, like if, if you take that aspect, it becomes a very, you, you know, boring. Well, no, because I think it just boils it down to the, the fact that this is life for, uh, I mean, boring. Yes. Every day. Yes. Every man. Yes. But also the emotions and the fear that goes into that. I think there's a lot of people who, who live that existence that are terrified, uh, you know, middle America, um, you know, you can, you can look at that situation and there's a whole lot of, um, of that fear that boils up into current politics, you know, that, you know, there, there are a group of people who would have voted for Bernie Sanders just as fast as they voted for Donald Trump based on that same type of idea. Um, hey, Craig, remember when uh, Caleb said he might overanalyze things over here? Man? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do remember that. I mean, possibly, but I mean, like you can't, you can't take out the fact that this, the, the, the kind of, real game changer in the story revolves around money i mean the dude's you know he, he's getting fired his, his source of money is coming out his wife talks to him about needing to pay the bills he hides a paycheck and like he gets robbed um he's going to cash a check a bank is getting getting robbed everything centers around his like the inevitability of him being impoverished um and the fear that goes into that and of course at the end of the day it could just be a weird story about a guy who gets shot in the head and sees some shit um but I think that's the magic and the the really incredible, incredibly talented craft that I think Maxwell Prince puts into a story. Um, and I have yet to decide whether or not I'm going to be happy if it's if that's all it is, um, depending on that second issue. Do do we want to talk about the fact that this guy the power went off in his house and he just goes on to work and leaves his family sitting in the dark? Yeah, that's. And that feeds into what I, you know, what I took from the book is he just, you know, 
he's not really accepting reality and addressing it. Right. And that, that line because I don't, crossing into delusion. Yeah. yeah, I don't I don't think he lives in reality. And I think it's probably kind of a take on the Joker movie a little bit. I think there I think there's definitely similar themes and tones to that. Yeah. Um, but I mean, like you know, and uh, yes, he should have taken steps to completely to to change his circumstances beforehand. But um, you know, there are a lot of people that live in situations where if they miss a day's work, they get fired. You know, just okay, your power. You know, yeah, his power went went out. So, assuming his wife is a able bodied human, um, you know, she can and take not care a balloon animal and not a balloon animal. Um, or, well, I mean the the. But the overriding thing is this hasn't been an ongoing problem for right. a long time yeah. and he's not addressed yeah. it. Um, and, and well, and you know, how, how either he has not addressed it or he doesn't have the, uh, the, the tools or the, the capacity to address it, which turns it into a really bleak and sad story. Um, I think there's a lot of sadness in this story. Um, and I think it being so bright and colorful and it being about a clown is a conscious choice to help mask some of that i think there's a level like there's an undertone of terror in this book uh, that I, I i personally really that's appreciate. just your fear of clowns the, also yeah. i am fucking terrified of clowns <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I mean I, I think matt's on to it that this is a guy that has disconnected from reality because he knows his life is complete and total crap and he's disconnected from reality and is living in this uh power of positive thinking to overcome the fact that you know, maybe his wife and kids have already left and replaced, and he's replaced them with animal balloons. Maybe, yeah. maybe they are actually there. And, you know, when he gets home because he's been shot in the head, he's either dead or, you know, they are animal balloons now in his imagination or whatever the case is. He's obviously living in some delusioned world. Yep. Or, you know, he's, he's mapped the world around him instead of accepting the fact that he needs to go do something besides be a clown, he's changed everything to where he's going to completely make everything part of this, uh, fantasy, this illusion of, of carnivalism, um, or, or, or what, whatever you want to call it. Um, he, he's done the exact opposite of what he should do. Uh, so I don't know. I, I think this is, there's some really strong writing in this book. And again, that is absolutely helped by Vanessa Del Rey. I like, I, I love, I love her art in this book. Um, Chris uh, Lauren's colors, uh, you know, added to the surrealist notions of, of what's in this book, the, the designs of everything, whether or not it's the, you know, the really cartoony moments that you see from when the bullets entering his brain. Um, and, and, and really that might be, it is. So there, there's a page in this book, right. Or it's, it's right when he's been shot in the head and it goes into it's, it's four panels on each page. Um, and, and this is where the, the art really shifts. And it's that bullet entering his cerebellum and you see all these little cartoon stars and rainbows and the clown emerges like it from the middle. And it's a very cartoonish clown. And it says, ta-da to me, that says the clown has 100% become the dominant force in this book. Like as far as the personality goes, the clown is driving the car at this point, not the man who was a clown at work at that point, everything is washed away. It's completely that clown personality has has grabbed a hold of him and everything after that um and and how dangerous that can be because he's he gets up and dismantles these armed robbers um and everything after that he's just seeing lives through this persona of clownliness <laughs> i don't know what else to call it so uh it's good shit uh it, it picked this book up regardless of whether or not it's going to be um one and done or if it's going to be an ongoing thing where you see what happens in his life afterwards. Um, well, I mean, I tend to believe Matt, I didn't read the uh, uh, solicitations for it. So I was know. unaware of that, but yeah. um, you know, I, I'm okay with these kind of mini one shot uh, anthology series, as long as they maintain their entertainment value. Well, I, did, did you guys read Ice Cream Man, which was, was the other series that he wrote, which also does that kind of thing where each story is, from what I understood, was um, like self-contained? I read probably the first 15 issues or so. Yeah. And then it started to wear on me. But um, 
at least in those stories, you had the common thread of the ice cream man in them. You know, so the the ice cream man himself is in every issue. Yeah. Matt, did you read that one? No, I missed that one. That was really why I made a point to pick this one up is because I did miss the ice cream man story or series and it was getting so much positive press. Oh, there, yeah. there's some great stories in there and some great, uh, you know, it, it just, it wore on me after a while, but that's not to say it wasn't very good. So, yeah, I read the first arc and I, I, I thought it was great. I just didn't pick up on it after that. And I need to go back and revisit it. But um, I think part of the reason that I, I didn't, and again, just because I'm a complete hypocrite because i absolutely love anthologies that are that are i have open-ended stories but i kept seeing so many things that i wanted to go on that didn't that i was just like damn it (laughs) so um i also want this book to go on just because there's there's a joke there about him popping his wife if she's a balloon and i I need that to be played out you think she just kind of floats around i don't know who can say so um well i I should say are y'all gonna give issue two a go uh, that's that's the question we always ask i am yeah. yeah i am i think so i think i am um matt did the solicit say um well i get actually the the next month the uh, issue two it gives a, a preview of what i'm guessing is the cover um and it's a different clown in front of a mirror and the artist listening on that is thorough good and I, I don't know who that is i'd have to google um so it looks like you're going to get a different artist on each each one so yeah i, I guess that's Matt just just broke that in a little news. Um, so it's an anthology about clowns, apparently. The worst idea I think ever. Um, no, I think it's a fantastic idea. <laughs> no, we'll not. see all the different ways that clowns are broken people, <sighs> which is going to do nothing but fuel my irrational, <laughs> <laughs> unnecessary fear of these creatures. <laughs> it's, it's even worse because they're not. They're, they're not terrifying clowns. I can deal with scary clowns. It's the happy ones that bother me. Um, I mean, remember a few years ago when the worst thing happening in the world was clowns showing up and just standing there in the why? background of things? That that was like the worst thing going on in the world. Like, oh, it was you know, six years ago. I oh, remember that. And I could never figure out why. Why would you do that? Like, that's <laughs> terrible people. Um, well, according to the little... Uh, little screen that i'm looking at uh that that is the technological advancement of how we do things and do this show um a man who we need to talk to has just entered the waiting room so we're going to break at this point we're going to have us a little conversation with a friend without any further ado um our, our brother our friend our fellow comic book lover but also um and he gets this credit in and of himself comic book creator mr john westoff has taken time out of his busy morning to join us this morning how you doing buddy Hey man, it's that dang old sci-fi geek here. Proud to have you. Oh, sorry about this. <laughs> I don't know what came over me. This this man is from Chicago and just boom Howard us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel it's always good to insult the host right away. No, <laughs> yeah, well, that's uh, you know that that's that just sets the tone. Uh, let's let's us know <laughs> how how it's gonna go. How's your how's your morning going so far, man? Oh, not not too bad, sir. Uh, yeah, you're one of the few I've uh, had the pleasure of, of being on a show that uh, starts early. So peek behind the curtain, people. We're uh, we're up early. Usually the, the podcasts are degenerate late night drinkers, but apparently you all are degenerate morning time drinkers. Yeah, we we enjoy uh, we enjoy getting together for coffee. Also, it's the only time our schedules let us do this. So uh, it is. It is not without necessity because trust me, I I, I also enjoy uh, running my mouth late at night when there are cups involved. But uh, we we just couldn't get our schedules to sync up for that. But so you're here today, um, you know, mailage and all that that stuff. But uh, no, we're going to talk about a new book that you have and that you recently, as a matter of fact, like four days ago, um, launched a Kickstarter for. Um, and that book is none other than Child Protective Services that you are doing. Um, with your longtime friend and comics partner, Bob Ornelius, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, well, I know I'm not mistaken because I'm looking at it right now. Um, but this is kind of a, a, new, a new endeavor for you, not only for the comic, but uh, for a new publisher. So um, why don't you just tell us a little, bit, a little bit about what CPS is 
And then then we can kind of just roll into, you know, the behind the scenes aspect of it, how this came to life um, and some of the stuff that you you have known to do in the past. No, thank you. You summarized it well. Uh, we're starting, or I should say, I'm starting a new endeavor. I, I've worked with Bob Gar for about 10 years under Kingbone Press, and we had a, a lot of fun and a lot of great experiences. But, you know, some things happen, life happened, and we ended up um, disbanding. And, and I, I took a couple of years off from comics, but kind of got bit by the bug last year. And this is our first book under this new label. So, yeah, we're excited to have it on Kickstarter now. I, I want to say, first off, I appreciate you, ha you all having me on the show. And I was hoping, you know, to come on for one of my first interviews and, and announce that it was fully funded. But, you know, it's, it's our first endeavor. So it is still up and it is still looking for funding, but it is Child Possession Services, CPS. And it actually is something that Bob and I started under um, Kingbone Press a couple of years ago. Uh, like all things with me, it started as a joke because, uh, you know, I'm kind of a joke. So <laughs> <laughs> why not start everything that way? But it started off as a... Um, as a, uh, a, a short, uh, I, I kind of, um, I kind of pitched the idea to Bob that we um, we would do a short that was like a spoof of Constantine because I was kind of taking a jab at him because he loves Constantine the Hellblazer, and yeah, so I, I kind of wrote a story based around that, and, and thankfully, you know, when you work with longtime friends and people who are invested in you and your you're in, in making properties with you together uh he kind of added so much to it uh and said well i think we actually have something here so let, how about we don't make it like a one-off joke and i'm like oh fine i guess so and i'm glad he did so <laughs> and here we are on kickstarter now well it may not be fully funded but i was looking at it this morning and it looks like you guys have have surpassed the halfway point in four days and so that's not a you know that's not a small feat uh, especially not for indie creators so i mean Number one, just congratulations for, for getting that. And I've got no doubt in my mind that between the folks who listen to our show and the folks who uh, are, you know, you know, you're, you're connected to through other podcasts and comics groups that, that this thing is going to get just, you know, it's going to get fully funded and get made. Like I, I've got no doubt in my mind, complete and total faith in that. So. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, you've known Bob Barron for a while obviously his art is an easy sell. He has, you know, beautiful lines. He does. It stars Connie Dar, who is a social worker for bedeviled children. Um, so I hope that the premise and the art alone is an easy sell, but yeah, Connie's a little bit of myself. I'm a social worker by trade um, and wanted to kind of make a story that was kind of working through some of the issues I've had with my career, you know, working in human services, you know, like comics it is kind of a grind. And uh, it doesn't always go the way that you plan. And Connie's kind of at a point in her career where, you know, she's a little bit burnt out. She's been doing this for a while. Um, it's, it's a little more slice of life horror than, and, and procedural than, you know, you know, super mystical or, or uh, supernatural in that way. It's more like, you know, if these possessions were more common around the world, what would be the government's response to it? And of course they would make, you know, a poorly run, you know, uh, morally ambiguous bureaucracy. Uh, you know, to uh, kind of combat it. So that's where she works. And it, you know, CPS is the common vernacular for child protective services. So I thought maybe like, you know, the spin on that would get people to, to kind of trigger what, what the book was about. Well, no, and it, it does. And it goes, it goes right there. And, you know, just for the folks at home, um, we were lucky that you, you know, so you guys gifted us with a review copy. So we were all able to read this. Um, and number one, what you said about Bob Gar's lines is right on point. Uh, like, I, you know, we've been, you know, we've been friends for a long time. We run in similar circles. So I've seen Bob Gar's art on, on several things before, but he, he just keeps getting better. And, you know, when it comes to comic art, it's not only just the individual panels, but his, his storytelling, it just, you know, it, it keeps being, uh, he, he keeps I don't know if graduating or leveling up is the the right turn of phrase, but it's it's one of those because yeah no it's just it's it's really great storytelling, and it's funny that you mentioned Hellblazer, uh, you know that that homage or that that connection is absolutely there, 
but it's interesting how sometimes when, you know, you're just randomly reading one thing and it connects with another thing. Uh, so, you know, here lately, I've been reading a little bit of BPRD, um, you know, the, the Hellboy spinoff stuff from Dark Horse and the Magnoliaverse. And I saw so much of the BPRD connection in this too. Did you, did you guys purposefully pull from that? Or was that more of a, just like a, a happy, happy happenstance? Uh, I'm glad that you noticed that. I don't think it was purposeful, but Bob and I are huge BPRD fans, huge Magnoliaverse fans, but particularly I've always enjoyed you know, like Kate Corrigan and BPRD and, 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 you know, the other directors of BPRD and kind of the, the procedural aspect of their jobs uh, and, and how, you know, Arcudi and all the great writers brought that to the BPRD verse. So, I, you know, I can't help but kind of put that in to books like this. So it definitely will kind of have some of that, you know, it, it, this is a, a complete story. It started as two shorts, like I said, and now Bob's doing a full length, um, 26 page story so it'll be 44 pages and you know we have more stories to tell but we are trying to you know we understand how indie comics work and sometimes people aren't going to be able to come back for the next story so we're trying to tell you know complete stories as well but but yeah i'm glad you noticed we, we definitely can't hide our bprv influence i don't hide it at all man it's it's great and, and i think it works it works really the the mechanics of it are, are perfect for this kind of story because you are talking about, you know, like you said, a, a bureaucracy and the types of people that um, work in there and how sometimes people with good intentions get ground down. And then you also you have a character in the story that um, I think is somebody who's just on a power trip, who's just seeking to abuse a position. Um, and, and both of them are arguably, you know, working towards the same goal. Um, and and just the juxtaposition of those two things really creates a tension um, in the story. Not, none the least of which is, is set aside by the fact that there are actual, I, I, I'm guessing demons, uh, you know, that are, are possessing human beings. Um, and, and the fact that there are laws in this world that govern that, which I thought, you know, with me being in law school, that part just really, uh, I got a big kick out of it. Um, so where did, where did the seeds get planted at? for this so how because because there, there are multiple threads in this and even though like you said it is one kind of all-encompassed enclosed story you can kind of see the different seeds and how they they eventually weave together so like where did the inception of this come from so the first couple pages of the book the first eight pages was the first short and it was kind of that that idea just popped into my head again it started you know as a little tongue-in-cheek joke uh you know for my um my co-creator Bob was looking for a story. He was, I think he was talking about doing like a, a short anthology or something he said, Hey, you know, uh, I'm writing most of the stories, but would you like to contribute? And I was like, well, I, I've had this idea for a while that popped into my head that like, you know, again, that uh, it, it's been a theme in some of my other work as well. Like hell has come to earth, but it's like life goes on. It's always been fascinating because, you know, the idea of hell and demons and stuff is, is you know, so much a part of our, our culture, you know, across the world. So I, I've always kind of been fascinated with that. And, and so it, it's kind of a, almost a shared universe that Bob and I have been working in in different stories. So this one was, well, you know, who actually works with these people when, you know, they're possessed. Uh, and that was what we came up with, you know, it, 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 most of the time in our world, you know, you make regulations, adults are able to do what they want, but kids, you know, they need special protection. That's kind of against, just kind of always on my mind because that's the line of work that, that I've been in for about 15 years or so. So that was kind of where the seeds, the seeds started. And then again, with Bob's help, kind of realizing, well, this character has more to say about that. And, and just kind of went from there. Nice. Um, yeah. Well, like I said, having, you know, it's, it's with, with these stories being that at max is going to be 44. It's, it's, it's one of those things it's, it's hard not to get giddy about and talk about, but I don't want to give too much away since it, uh, you know, since you are kickstarting it, fo folks need to get their hands on it. You don't want to give too much away for free. Right. Um, so like, like I said, it, it's a great story. Connie is sarcastic. Uh, she's funny. She is a little broken. Um, and, and I know, I know you said that you're, you know, you being a social worker by trade is, is there a lot of you in Connie or is this one of those things like you just took a framework um, and pulled from, you know, like you said, from some of the influences, uh, you know, vertigo and, and other horror stories, um, or, or is this, 
seriously a part of is there a part of John Westoff that's been just kind of distilled in this really sarcastic um, demon fighting <laughs> badass? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, um, I, I typically write the other side of my personality more often. I, I, unfortunately, that's just kind of the writer I am. I, you always try to put a little bit of yourself in each character. And when we were developing it again, it, it, it started as a little bit of a spoof of Constantine. So I was kind of already thinking of the, the character being a little bit more rough around the edges. And again, Bob added a lot to it. There, there's some things... Um, you know, I think that uh, reflect him as well in here. So it's kind of an amalgamation of, of the darker side of, of both of us. Um, I, I don't want to say whether or not either one of us wanted to be, you know, an American woman of Eastern Indian descent, but maybe we did. Um, <laughs> maybe there's some of that too. <laughs> the tiny is also very much based on a, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting some background noise. Oh, no, that's, that's fine. It, it happens. That's one of the, um, issues of technology, uh, new technology in the era of the pandemic. It happens. Yeah, and I'm sorry. I actually, I, I thought if I went out uh, to my car away from the kids, it would be less noisy. And I, I apologize to anyone listening. If there's a little bit, of, a little bit of background noise, but but yeah, as, as I was saying, she's once Bob kind of made the suggestion about you know where he wanted the character to be as far as her background. Uh, honestly, I, I worked with two women who I very much respect. They're, they're wonderful social workers. And they kind of helped me just kind of, it just was in my mind right then. It was kind of a combination of, of those two people and, and what they shared with me about, you know, um, growing up as, as women who, who were in, um, both were in arranged marriages, both were, uh, you know, of, you know, uh, Western Asian descent, I guess is the best, best way to say it. Um, they uh, shared a lot with me and I, I was you know, close to one more than the other, but, but, but both had very interesting, fascinating stories to me and just were wonderful people and, and just, in, you know, involved with the helping profession. And they, um, you know, were a big inspiration for this story. You gotta, you gotta love when, when, when kind of our environments in, in real life are able to, to filter down into art like that's just there's so much that we can like artists you know be it be it you know physical uh, sequential artists or or writers can pull from um if they just kind of look around you know what i mean like and, and I, I, it probably helps that that you are in a place that you know again like i said you're from you know you're from illinois uh, in in and around chicago the chicago area so I'm, I'm sure it helps that you have a place that kind of appreciates multiculturalism um, you, you know, as, as opposed to, you know, we're sitting down here in Little Rock, which, you know, it's got about 16 square feet of culture if you look real hard, but, but outside of that, it's very, um, you know, it's, it's very predominantly white, very predominantly, uh, Judeo-Christian. Um, and, and I, I think that's why you see those different kind of stories come out from, from different regions. So it's, you know, kudos for you for having the, the wherewithal to pull from that, to pull from your surroundings and to pull from, from what you've learned from other people, because um, it is, it is interesting when you see, you know, and I say this as a white dude myself who tries to dabble in writing, it's interesting trying to write a character who is, who doesn't fit into the, you know, the demographics that you do. Um, Was that, was that a challenge for you? Is that something that you were kind of worried about? Um, or something that was on, I don't necessarily think worried about maybe the right thing, but was that something that you were conscious of or w- were there hurdles to, to jump over with that? Oh, no, I, I definitely think, um, you know, that I think that's okay to acknowledge, you know, there was, there was some, some worry, some, some uh, apprehension. Uh, most of my characters to this point have been Caucasian. Um, thankfully, you know, Part of it, like you said, is exposure. And I'll be honest, you know, I am outside of Chicago, but I did, yeah, I've predominantly grown, grown up in, you know, the suburbs are, are very, you know, Caucasian centric. And, you know, thankfully I do live by a big city and I've had a lot of experience to work and, and other things to be exposed. And I think that has been important, but I, I still think I would have been apprehensive to take that plunge if, you know, my co-creator who, you know, he is 
he is uh, a Mexican. Right. He was right. the one who really pushed the ethnicity of the character and said, you know, I, and he's told me this before, you know, John, not everybody has to be white. And he's right. It is a trapping that you get into for multiple reasons, you know, part of your own background, but part of it is that uncomfortableness and not being sure if you should take, you know, that step. And I, I really do honestly feel like I would not have been comfortable writing her as a main character if I didn't have somebody real to pull from, um, you know, from their experience. I, I mean, I haven't, for better or worse, I, I've never divulged to them that they, they, you know, were the character, but I, I've known them for, you know, 15 years and, and, and it just really gave me a real base to start with. Um, we, we, we don't necessarily in the first issue, you know, we'll see, we don't necessarily go into her background, but I still think it's, it's, it's better to have a real place to go to than kind of pulling from what, you know, you see in other films or other things like that. So that, that gave me a much more grounded approach. And I said, okay, no, I think I'm comfortable, you know, with taking this, this step in writing and, and writing somebody outside of my, you know, cultural black background. Well, you know, you, you have the opportunity right here to uh, go ahead and reveal who that is. If you want to, you know, breaking news is always okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm playing. Um, so did, is the book in the can at this point? Is it done other than printing? I'm glad that you asked that, Craig. We, we typically don't. I, I've been part of seven successful crowdfunding uh, campaigns. Only had one that didn't you know, reach its goal. And typically we have, you know, 90% done. You know, it's just, you know, maybe lettering, finishing, coloring, printing. This one's probably halfway done. You guys got half okay. the book. Uh, that's part of why it kind of ends a little awkwardly as in, in the preview book because you know bob is you know he's churning away at the art and maybe i jumped the gun a, a little bit you know being excited wanting to get into 2021 you know on the right foot so this is one of the few that we've ever really done where where we were a little bit ahead but again we've never really had a problem fulfilling bob and i are very dedicated i should mention too that we've brought in an amazing colorist this time to help us uh you know bob does great coloring but you know, he'll be the first to admit it's not his strength and he's very slow at it. So we were able to bring in Winston Gambro, who you'll see on the, on the last four pages, you know, really ups, you know, the whole package with his great coloring. So he's got a lot of work to do left, but, you know, again, Bob's turning away at the pages and, and we're definitely anticipating this fulfilling on time in, in June of this year. Well, I personally am a sucker for Kickstarter, um, especially when it's someone I know and I did just, uh, while looking at the page, went and actually uh, purchased the book. Uh, stretch goals are a big thing. I know I see a couple on here. Do you have plans for stretch goals? Yeah, we, we announced one stretch goal in there to try and, you know, kind of get people excited to help us get it funded because that is a big part of it. And, and we really appreciate your support because it is, you know, insanely important. So, so I appreciate you, you backing it. Um, we, we have... Uh, you know, in social services, you know, a lot of government things, a lot of jobs in general, you know, you wear those dorky ID badges. So we made like a mock-up of that, you know, what her ID badge would be. Um, so we're, we're going to do that as a sticker. I also, you know, you talk about Kickstarter and, you know, support and community is such a big part of, uh, you know, the small press books. Uh, I'm, I'm part of a group of creators that really, I, I was, out of comics i didn't really want to do it anymore you know and just watching you know being part of some of these facebook groups and, and people cheering each other on and, and just talking about their success it, it it really helped me want to get back into it and that that group is called the indie comics conspiracy yeah yeah, so yeah, they yeah donated some books um for us so if we do reach our goal people will be getting you know four or five you know free books from some awesome indie creators as well and that they'll be sharing ours and in, in their crowdfunding so we've kind of uh, teamed up a little bit to make you know some stretch goals uh for each other and, and i think that that kind of encapsulates a lot of what the indie comic spirit is so so those are our two first stretch goals that's very cool that's awesome that you're teaming up with the the indie comics conspiracy folks because uh you, you know not being a comics creator but just being in the the circles I, I know a lot of those folks as well and it's it's great to see this kind of conglomerate um rise up of of folks just supporting each other and that's one of those you know 
in nerd culture, being if you're in indie culture or in, you know, big two culture, comics culture can be really shitty. And a lot of times it's a lot of folks trying to tear each other down to put it, pull themselves up a little bit. And I got to say, like, it's not that in the indie comics uh, conspiracy circles. Like it is really folks who love this medium and who love telling stories the way that they do trying to help each other out. Like that's, that's cool. I didn't realize you had linked up for them. That just kind of makes my heart swell up with, with happy. Yeah, particularly there's, there's a couple creators and, and um, you know, admins in those groups who really, you know, push people and, and, you know, goals can be different. You know, my goals at, at almost 40 with, with doing this again is, is much different than other people who want, you know, I don't know, to sell a million copies or, or, or get a TV show or whatever. Of course, I would love to wake up tomorrow and, and, and the Kickstarter be funded at a million dollars. Of course, anybody would enjoy that. But, you know, my goals now is, is really to write stories, to make stories with creators that, that I respect, admire, and enjoy working with. I have some other multiple projects going behind the scenes besides this with, with people I wanted to work with for many years. And, and, and that's my goal at my, this point in my career. And I just think it's great to find people that want to encourage that and support each other in different ways. It just, it, it helps keep you going because it is a lot, you know, part of the name of the, the company part-time comics is a little tongue in cheek joke about, you know, I had to be honest with myself. You have to, you have to have boundaries with how much you take on. And with Kingbone Press, you know, I, I was trying to really promote other people's projects. And, and it, did, it didn't bother me if I put a project out and I don't make it. Uh, it doesn't sell, you know, 200, 300, 400 copies. But when I try to promote, you know, my friends and my peers and, and I'm not able to get them there, it really weighed heavy on me. Um, so it seems a little selfish, actually, to step back a little bit and really just kind of refocus on my own personal projects with, you know, with co-creators, of course. But, you know most all the books i should say that will be under part-time comics you know i have to have direct involvement in because i just it was just very hard um to not see you know not be able to help other people make the goals that that, that i was trying to help them reach but but it is so great to have a community you know around you that's a big part of comics in general and you're right there's a lot of toxic people but but when you find those who, who truly you know are into comics for the joy of it uh it, it, it can really inspire you. And that's, you know, part of the reason I'm, I'm even on Kickstarter right now is because of that. Well, since we're, since we're talking about Kickstarter and this is something I've been hoping to pick your brain in particular about for a while. Cause, cause so, so like you said, you've, you've had several successful campaigns. You've been doing this for almost a decade and 10 years. And, uh, in the, well, that was redundant to say a decade and 10 years. So excuse my, stupidisms this morning it, like you said it's early as shit um <laughs> I gotta, my coffee's got to get kicked in uh one of the things that we've seen in crowdfunding i really think in the like the last maybe two maybe three years is that the focal point of crowdfunding has been yanked away maybe from smaller creators from independent publishers and stuff and now you've got like these people with full, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see them in diamond previews, publisher backing um, that are launching these, these Kickstarters and they're launching, they're using crowdfunding to, to, to pull up big books that, that are later going to be in the shelves of every comic shop across the United States. Has that like, what is your opinion? And, and you may have a completely like, Hey, no, it's, it's fine. Like, I'm just, I'm very curious what your opinion of that is and how, like, how you think that's affected Kickstarter comics. Has it, has it been beneficial to maybe bring in new people into the Kickstarter world? Has it been a, a, you know, kind of a, an albatross that is, uh, you know, way like it takes money from smaller creators. What, what do you think about that? Like, how does that affect your world? Well, I think it's an interesting topic and I don't want to profess that I am an expert on it, you know, having under 10 crowdfunding campaigns, um, you know, across a couple of platforms, but I have to tell you, you know, working in, in professional fields that rely a lot on, you know, statistics, I, I don't know if we'll ever see those numbers exactly, but I will tell you, this comes up every six months or so, you know, when a big creator comes up right now, it's, it's, I believe it's Power Rangers from Boom is on there. Right. A couple months ago, it was Keanu Reeves. Um, but I will tell you, as far as how the platform is set up, speaking specifically to Kickstarter, 
um, it, it can only help. For example, with Boom, they they actually a, a couple creators, you know, that I know through groups, not personally, but acquaintances. Boom went and backed fifty projects on there for a hundred dollars themselves. They, nice. It was their way of saying, "Here's some goodwill. We're, 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 we saw your projects by putting ours up here. Here's what we want to do." And you know, I, I had a disagreement with somebody online about this, and I posted a picture. It had, of course, Power Rangers was was featured on the front page of Kickstarter. You know, as it should be. It was one of the biggest books at the time in that category. But right below it was another book, and you know, I kind of sent him that screen cap, and I said. You know, again, somebody coming here to Power Rangers is probably going to buy Power Rangers at the store anyway, right? They're actually pulling, to me, it seems like they're pulling in people who, who wouldn't typically use Kickstarter. And then those people are seeing other projects. And then those people are getting the emails afterwards saying, oh, you back Power Rangers, you may like, you know, child possession services. You may, well, probably not. <laughs> uh, you may like, you know, Belial or Into the Void or any of those books, you know, that have been up recently. And I think that that can only help. I, I feel like they're pulling the Wednesday warriors away who, who again, would, would probably back the book uh, and, and find him. Like Keanu Reeves, he, he may bring in, you know, tons of, of uh, you know, patrons who, who wouldn't normally go to Kickstarter at all. And then they're part of the Kickstarter network. They sign up for other books. They, they get the emails, you know, weekly and monthly uh, about comics and, and, and other um, categories and things that are on Kickstarter. So, that's just my feeling. Again, I haven't seen the statistics. Of course, we, realistically, we understand people only have so many finances, so much finance to go towards. It's probably not the crowd that says, I have $5 to spend on indie books this month only. I can only buy this, you know, Power Ranger book. And that's it. I feel like eventually it's going to loop at least a handful of people into, into, you know, picking up independent books and then go from there. And that's, you know, the kind of help that independent books need uh, is free advertising like that, uh, free eyes on the book. And, and what better way to do it than, you know, a couple hundred thousand people. Come. See, that's the kind of positive take that I rely on. Like nothing, nothing says positivity like John Westhoff. Many people don't know that, but it's true. Uh, you know, I like you to delete that from the record. I don't like a. People that. <laughs> I like to be known as an internet bug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nah, dude. Um, you know, I got nothing but love for you. Uh, so John and I know each other and this is, you know, little, little thing is it's good to have friends. John and I know each other from the 11 o'clock comic circle. Um, that's where we first met um, and got to be buddies from, uh, you know, and before the, the plague, <laughs> we would, we would meet up together like once a year at a con uh, in some far off land or well, not for me, not for him um, and, and see each other. So it's always, it's always good to, to see his face. Um, and I, I cannot wait. I cannot wait till the world returns to, uh, you know, some level of non-infection and we can do that again. Um, so John, I know, I know, like you said, you've got Bob Gar, um, and he's, you, you have the history with him. Are there any other, um, and, and this might not even be something that you can talk about it. Are there any other folks from King bone, uh, that are, that are going to come up into part-time comics or are you doing any more work with uh, any familiar names? Well, I'm always trying to uh, harass my uh, previous creators into doing stuff. Uh, Brian Bowles, it does have yes. a wonderful pinup in, in this book and I'm always trying to involve them. Harry Moyer and I have, have a project in the works uh, very much in the starting stages, but I, I, we actually started a discard group of, Bob and Harry started called uh, the KVP Survivors Club. So kind of an inside joke about, uh, you know, getting out. But now all we do is talk about, hey, how are we going to work together? And who wants to work together? And, you know, uh, a bunch of other guys, Matt Nixon, who did both for Chicken with us, and, and mm -hmm. Brian and Robert, all these guys are in there. And it, I said, you know, why did we even disband the company? We're all just talking about doing the same thing. You know? So you can't help it. You know, you form connections. And, you know, I think that that, for, again, for me, that's that's part of my goal. Uh, I am working with, I'm, I'm trying to branch out a little bit and work with uh, some artists that, again, I've kind of had on my bucket list that I wanted to approach and work on a project with, but that that is no 
that is, is not to besmirch my wonderful uh, co-creators that I've worked with. I, I will always try to find a way. I do joke with Brian uh, that I, I, I have made him suffer enough. He's done over 500 pages, of, almost 600, I think, probably at least 600 pages of comics with me and and i've disabused that poor man i know he says he, he was willing but i just feel like uh i don't know so, something happened I, I must have some sort of midichlorians or something that, that <laughs> mind control him because he just he's just the greatest and and we do great comics together but but for now i said you know brian take a couple years off i've, I've abused you enough but yeah it's quite long long answer short yes quite a few of us are already you know uh, brewing projects, including Bob and I have another project that we're trying to pitch to, to some companies as well. So, uh, well, just number one, you're out, I'll pull you back in. Uh, I was just going to say, number one, we're all better for that abuse that you put Brian through because Hellbillies is awesome. Um, I've got a big, big old copy of it right here on my shelf. Um, but also, I noticed that uh, as far as, you know, we're, we're t we talk a lot about the art inside the book. You've got some really great covers uh, on the out, you know, some, some art on the outside of the books that uh, look phenomenal, including some non, uh, you know, people who like comics and that we know through different comic circles, but people who are traditionally like high, uh, qu I'm using air quotes, but not because of anything, just because of the way we, we conceptualize art, but high, high art artists um, like Robert Hafferman, who does these incredible, um, just absolutely stunning portraits. Um, of, of kind of real life uh, people in his life or people that he sees. He just does these kind of studies of, of human anatomy and then mixes them with, with color. Uh, so I saw that you've got him doing a, a, a variant cover for you. Um, are, there, are there any other folks outside of comics, any other artists outside of comics that you're, you're roping in? Not for this project, but I, I have put some feelers out there for, for some other um, projects and I definitely am to be honest with you, Robert, that was a, that was a gift for Bob, you know, for working with me and, and, and creating, you know, a character that we both were, you know, very invested in. And I kind of backdoored Robert into letting me use it as a variant cover. Cause I, I just basically said, can you do, you know, you do these amazing, you know, portraits. Can you do one of our character, Connie? And he was like, Oh yeah, great. And of course, you know, you see it. Uh, it's just, you know, the most amazing piece, you know, the guy's just infinitely talented. So I, I did, beg and, and plead if you let me use it as, as a cover. Uh, so that one was kind of a backdoor, but I, I'm also very interested in, in, in working with different artists. It's, it's particularly for covers. They can just tell so much about the story. And, and, and if you kind of branch out, not, and of course, Bob's cover is, is so great. I have, that's a piece that hangs on my wall and I'll never get rid of that. I, I love his cover as well, a comic artist, but when you get someone who's kind of outside the zone like that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm always looking for people to uh, to take it to the next level on, on a great eye-catching cover like that. No, it worked because it, it's it's stupid good. And and yeah, that was not to besmirch Bob Gar's cover um, by any means because, you know, I got nothing but love for Bob Gar. Like that guy's, he's just stupid good. He's just, it's stupid how much talent he has uh, that he just hides <laughs> he just hides yeah, inside and, that and little and you're right. And, and I think he, he would acknowledge it too. He, he, you know, you'll see on the art for the, um, for the, the, the larger story that's in here, that the newer stuff that he's, he started just a few months ago, you know, he'll, he even acknowledged to me. I mean, he really is. He has a lot of, you know, bottle of talent and, and over the last 10 years, seeing him start from being amazing to be even more amazing. It has been, you know, great for me too. And I, I'm glad that, you know, he takes my silly scripts and, and makes them, you know, infinitely better. So I'm very fortunate in that regard. Well, and at the end of the day, I think that's something that, you know, we, we kind of, and this goes back to what you were saying earlier. We, we kind of, we have the ability as people to set our own levels of success. Like we, we get to determine what success means to us. And, and like you said, as you've gotten older, like your priorities have changed into where you're just at the end of the day, you're wanting to make great stories with cool art with people that you genuinely enjoy. And I can say from, from our end, you know, it's a different thing, but doing, doing this podcast, like I would love to wake up and have, you know, 1 billion listeners and, and be able to like look down on Joe Rogan <laughs> and just be like, I've more people like me than you. Um, 
but I also <laughs> don't care if we get like two folks listening to the podcast. At the end of the day, I like talking about cool things and having interesting conversations with with my friends. We, you know, with 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 two gentlemen on the show that do this show with me that are you know some of my favorite folks on the planet, and and I think we have that benefit, especially as being again not not saying that one is equal to the other but you know being an indie comics or being a comics creator in general or being at a a low level just kind of niche podcast um just being able to do something that you enjoy and to be able to set your own own pace and you know you set your own goals that you go towards and there's something in doing that you get an enjoyment out of it like those those successes seem somehow sweeter um, because you appreciate them, you you, you know, at, at the end of the day. So, um, dude, I, I love what you guys are doing. You know, I've been a fan of King Bone. I've got, uh, you know, copies of of different floppies upstairs in, uh, in long boxes that, you know, with King Bone all over it. So I really I really can't wait to see what you guys do with, with part time. Um, I, I'm, I'm incredibly happy. Uh, you know, I, I made a post whenever you announced that King Bone was was closing the doors and it was a very bittersweet moment because it was one of those things you wanted to celebrate the success that you guys had but it was also something you know it's like okay i'm watching watching my friends that that they're they're ending this endeavor so when when i found out about part-time comics um you know i audibly audibly laughed like i I clapped i was i was happy because you guys have more stories to tell uh, and and you have good stories to tell and at the end of the day it's fun seeing people who i genuinely like um make themselves happy by, by, by creating something. So, um, and, and that's not to just, you know, suck your dick on the air or anything, but it's just to say, Hey, like I'm happy for you guys. And I, and I love that you guys are not stopping. Well, no, I, I appreciate that. And then fellatio aside, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to hear that. <laughs> like you said, I appreciate you kind of laying that out there. The definition of success, you know, when you go to like writers panels or stuff, everybody asks, how do I break into comics? How do I break into comics? And, and I think comics and, and podcasting, like you said, it, it's, it's one of the few creative mediums where, um, you know, if you, if you, with a little talent and, and you work hard enough, you can get your book, you know, on the shelf right next to Amazing Spider-Man. Um, and, and that's really cool. Uh, so I think when people say, how do I break into comics? If you're asking, how do I make a lot of money or how do I become the most popular I, I keep that no one can crack that egg. And so I think people go in with the wrong attitude uh, in that success, like you said, is, is defined by yourself. And, and when you have a finished product or sometimes the success is conversations like we're having right now, uh, connections you make, friendships you make along the way, uh, having that, that finished product that you made with somebody that you were both invested in, it, that is success. Uh, and people need to understand that. Of course, the financial part comes into it. Uh, like we said, I, I'd love to pay all my artists, you know, top dollar. That that would be, you know, an amazing goal. Uh, so the finance, you know, comes into it. You know, these are adults and, and, and their time is valuable. So, you know, I am trying to get better with the business aspect of it. But I do feel like I've had a lot of success. I've had a lot of great comics, had a lot of, of great moments, great conventions. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, that, that might be your success. And, and, and I hope that more people would be happy with that. Um, and not focus so much on, you know, the, the being infinitely, you know, popular and financially successful because that doesn't, this doesn't happen. Yeah. I was uh, just checking the Kickstarter page and wanted to kind of go over some of the goals here. Uh, some of the pledges people can make and it, it ranges anywhere from a $4 gift. If you just want to help out up to a $250 advertisement that you can, uh, put it into the book if you so choose so there is a level on there for everybody um, and different i think i saw one that uh, you could actually get uh, the hell uh, billy's omnibus along with it so there are a lot of different options for people to uh tune in on there thank you yeah there, we we tried to include you know we have a lot of product uh, Bob's doing a couple commissions. We, we're doing some stickers and magnets, which seem to be really popular, which I'm excited about. Because again, as I mentioned, I love Bob's cover and, you know, putting more of that out there is great. Um, but yeah, I, I did, I will say, I tried to focus a little bit more on, you know, the product itself and things that I could do and, and, and additional books. Because 
in the past, you know, my artists have, have the artists I work with um, have done a lot of work on the back end, but you know, they do a lot of work already. So I need to find different ways to, to get the financial support without overworking them even more. So uh, I will say that the, the tiers are a little slimmer than they, they usually are. We don't have big, big tickets, uh, you know, original art or, or commissions. Uh, not a lot of that is available because, you know, again, I'm trying to be respectful of, of the people I work with. So, you know, the commissions, there's very few left. Again, there's some stickers, there's uh, advertisement. I, I'm offering some lettering. If you are an independent um, creator, I'm offering, you know, some great prices on lettering through the, the Kickstarter. So, you know, trying to think of different ways to, to meet our financial goals, um, which you have to do with these things, um, but also not overwork the creative team. What well, do, yeah, there's, go ahead, Caleb. Uh, I was just going to ask what, what we have to pledge to get the, the Southern Fried Geekery logo tattooed on Bob Gar. That, that's my question. Well, I, I mean, I assume at this point he, he, he just gets everybody's, uh, everybody's uh, logo tattooed down his spine, so he probably already has it. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, that, was, that was just my little silly um, interlude, Greg. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's all good. Um, I was just going to, you know, kind of follow up with what uh, John had talked about and just uh, say that even with cutting some of that out, there's still plenty of different levels, so don't feel like you're not uh, there's not there's something on there for everybody at any level that they want to uh, join in to fund this and John make sure you go onto our page and uh, share it on our page as well in the group oh I appreciate that yeah I, I was trying trying not to spam everybody but uh, appreciate the permission you're you're always welcome to uh, advertise a, a book in our group. I mean, you are a contributor to our group and uh, always welcome to uh, go in there and uh, advertise. Facts, your family, dude. You know, you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to be stressed about that at all. Um, anytime we, we love supporting our friends. We love supporting the folks who, who make cool stuff um, and who really bring, bring a light to the medium that, I mean, you know, we're all a bunch of grown ass men who sit around and talk about, you know, people in capes and outside underwear all the time. Uh, so, you know, it, it, we, we do this because it makes us happy. So we want to support the folks who help create those things. So I'm also going to, if you're just happen to be listening to this and maybe you're not on the Southern Fried Geekery Facebook group or you don't follow us on Twitter um, or Instagram or anything like that, I'm going to put the link to the Kickstarter in the show notes. Um, so if you, however you listen to your podcasts, if you click on, uh, you know, the information button or what have you, you'll find the link uh to the to the kickstarter to this and you can go jump on that and and give what you can uh you know you, you know get a copy of the book get a pdf uh, which is the version that i'm signing up for um just because <laughs> that way i'll have it sooner um uh, you can get a hard copy of the book you can you can get whatever you want so definitely go support this um john i know you're a family man and i i realize that you're sitting outside in a car right now so i don't want to keep you um, away from your your people any longer than you have to but you got anything you want to uh, say as, as parting words anything else you want to throw out there into the world no i appreciate that you know grandma's here holding down the fort so they're they, uh, always excited when she's here anyway but no yeah uh uh you know i appreciate you bringing up the southern inside geekery uh group on facebook both jump in there uh that's really what i came on now, now that we've gotten all this yes out of the way can we can we talk about star wars memes because that's really the reason i came on the show <laughs> <laughs> uh, if we we do share a few we we there's some there's some hotness uh in the meme world uh, star wars aside though I, if we're going to talk about memes i think we have to talk about bernie <laughs> those bernie memes though Yes, and, and the, the Lord of the Rings and the Star Wars version were the best one. So, right, right, that's true. There, there you go. Now, I see you say it was the best one. I'm gonna I'm gonna dust the, the dirt off my own shoulders real quick. I made one where he was posing with Wu Tang Clan. I'm holding that that's the best one. That's that's just me though. Oh, you made that one. Oh, <laughs> just, yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> there were some some great ones. But yeah, right now he's dominating the world, but hopefully we can get back to just regular old Star Wars memes soon. Yeah. Got to we got to get some fresh blood in the meme world. <laughs> it, uh, it stormed the gates, so to speak. <laughs> well, John, brother, we appreciate you coming on, man. Um, good luck in both. Like like I said, I have all the faith that this is going to get funded. I can't wait to to see what else 
comes out of it. Can't wait to see the finished package. Um, and I mean, just keep killing it, dude. Doing a great job, both both in the comics world and and in the work you do in your real life. I mean, yeah, you know, social work is a uh, it's one of those jobs that doesn't get nearly enough thanks and doesn't get a nearly enough appreciation. So uh, you're good people. Yeah, my is what I'm saying. my daughter's a social worker, and I'm well aware of the the efforts and the time that it takes to do that job. So just thanks for being out there doing that. I, really, I thank you so much, and thanks to her. And you know, people, I, I'm certainly not as um, I don't know, philanthropic as the word is as, as Caleb. I, people give me a, a lot more credit, at, you know, in the social work profession, but it certainly it helps in the, you know these kind of moments when you're stressing about a Kickstarter or a comic is nothing compared to the perspective you get from from the wonderful people you work with and, and what they go through every day. It certainly right. uh, helps you uh, realize that. that you, you know what? If this case starter doesn't make it, I'm gonna be okay. And uh, there you go. So, uh, all about perspective, right? It's all about perspective. All right, that was fun. That was a good interview. Um, yeah. So again, go check out the show notes for this book um, or for this episode, and you'll see the link to um, to Child Possession Services uh, by our good friend John Westoff and Mr. Bob Gar. Um, like you said, Craig, uh, Craig, I think you mentioned it. There's a $4 level. If you just want to, you know, you know, give a buddy a gift. Um, Hey, we appreciate that you're indie comics folks working hard. Here's four bucks just for nothing. Go do it. Um, there's a $10 tier. There's a $20 tier. You can, you can do what you want, but, um, you know, support, support indie comics. Um, it's fun times, fun stuff. We really appreciate him taking time out of his busy morning, uh, to chit chat with us. Um, and and tell us about this this new experience so good luck to everybody involved seriously i can't i can't wait to to get my copy of it um as always um next week new comics come out uh tuesdays wednesdays it's not really new comic book day anymore it's more like new comic book midweek um and we always try to give you folks a taste of of what's coming out that we might want to that we might dig into we think is is worth checking out could be something new could be an ongoing thing but um it always helps me figure out what i need to add to my list what i need to to, to read what is new out there so why don't you guys drop some drop some knowledge on me and tell me what you're grabbing this next week yeah uh, i'm gonna tell people to go out and get the uh, captain america omnibus uh, the brew baker ed brew baker omnibus volume one is hitting I've read the story. It's fantastic. Uh, probably my favorite Captain America story. And, uh, you know, if you enjoy the MCU version of Captain America, this is the story you need to read. Yep. I'm going to tell, so again, I'm going to remind everybody how thin the week is this week. So I'm going to recommend a book that I've recommended several times. Uh, X-Men number 17. This one is the main title. So of course it's still written by Jonathan Hickman with uh, internal art by Lino Francis Yu covers by Brett Booth. That's somewhat interesting, but this particular issue is previewed as Cyclops storm and Marvel girl answer the call of the Shi'ar empire for help. And I'm just, I'm really interested to see what these three characters, how they, how they interact together. I've, how is that book? I haven't heard a lot about it. Shut up. <laughs> hey, so you, you mentioned, um, you mentioned Brett Booth. Um, I don't know if you've read uh, Marvel comic, or I don't know if you've seen the ads in the last couple of Marvel comics that I've, I've picked up, but apparently Brett Booth is coming back and doing a series. Uh, he's doing an X-Men series. That, Marvel. Oh my gosh. That'll be interesting. A nineties, a nineties art guy doing that x-men that'll be interesting to look at you, you know who's you know who's writing it Mm-mm. fabian nicieza good lord this yep. is a this is a flashback oh, i'll, I'll my uh, gosh. i'll go find the ad that i saw and i'll send it to you but yeah nicieza and brett booth are doing a doing an x-men series together um which is which nice. is cool right it's good it's big doings um so a new it'll series- either be the best thing you've read in forever or not the best thing you've read in forever <laughs> uh, i should give my prediction but i'll save it yeah exactly 
it's it's all <laughs> yeah <laughs> we'll see um <laughs> I like Fabian Nicieza. So I think he, he was he was a good writer. Um, I haven't read anything recently, but it'll be good to to see what he's got going on. Um, so I think I spoke about this book that I want you all to pick up, or at least I spoke about the first issue of it. Um, I can't remember if it was a short stack or if it was in detail um, in one of the past episodes, but it's the new uh, the new Scrosi book, um, Post Americana number two comes out. Um, you guys know this guy. He he did Maestros. Uh, he was a co-creator on uh, We Stand on Guard, um, and it's it's awesome. So, uh, two characters, Carolyn and Mike, they're on a mission to stop the quote unquote new president, and they get interrupted when they're captured by a gang of cannibal maniacs. Um, and you know, if you know Scrosi's art, then you know him drawing cannibal maniacs is pure artistic sequential fire. Uh, it's it's badass. Um, so you know go go check this out because like the like the pitch says these man eaters love to play with their food um so no seriously this is a really really good book the first issue was 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 awesome so go check go check that out uh post americana from the image nice um well gentlemen do we have anything else we need to cover any any shout outs any any hellos goodbyes no covered it thank we did all right well um folks all y'all listening at home, we really, uh, oh, you know what? I do have a, and this is, you know, we don't talk about sports on this show very often, but uh, RIP to the great Hank Aaron who passed away. Yeah. Yesterday. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. I think that's terribly sad. Yeah. That he, he, he was the king. Um, and some like a large part of his life didn't get the, the, his due and proper. So uh, still the king in my opinion, damn Skippy. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, it, you know, if you, if you were into baseball, um, as I am a little bit, and as I know Craig, Craig is. So it was a sad day. Um, but all right. So all y'all listening at home, if you enjoy the podcast, and we really hope you do, uh, we we do it number one because we like to, but we also want to deliver something quality uh, to you guys. If you will do us a a solid, if you will go on however you listen to your podcast, and if they have a place that they that they allow you to leave a rating and review. If you will give us a rating and review, um, it not only helps the algorithms that these things are ran off of uh, bump us a little bit, but anybody who's looking for a comic space podcast, they'll go on there and they'll say, Hey, people say this is worth listening to. Maybe they'll take your recommendation. They'll give us a shot. We would really appreciate it. Um, and if nothing else, word of mouth always works great. So if you got comics buddies who listen to podcasts, and they're not listening to us, let them know about us. We, you know, we, 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 we hope we are delivering something, um, worthwhile if we're not we're not going to change so that's just too bad for you uh, that's just kind of how yeah it's our show nanny nanny boo boo just kidding um, but if you want to uh, get more if you want to broaden your horizons um, speak to us on a you know kind of, some kind of personal level you can do that you join our little facebook group uh, we're southern fried geekery on the facebooks or if you want to see what we're reading see what we're talking about you can follow us on instagram and twitter we're at sfg podcast on both of those if you are like mr john westoff and his partner bob gar and you are an independence comics creator um, and you've got a project maybe you're going to kickstart it maybe you're not maybe you're just going to do a zine and you're going to put it out there into the world um we really like promoting indie stuff um it's i love indie comics we really like helping people get their voices elevated because quite frankly it's you know something that i think we should do um and that's like that grassroots advertising is a big part of what makes the world go around in any number of circles so shoot us an email send us your stuff tell us hey check this out and we'll talk about it um we'll we'll give it we'll, you know we'll give it a read and we'll see what's going on we'll, we'll mention it on the show um we're southern fried geekery at gmail.com um and if nothing else, I know I've got homework to do. Craig's got to go blow leaves. Matt, I, who knows what Matt gets up to um, and all his shenanigans. Uh, but we, we're going to break from here and go go live life. Um, have a great week. Be safe. Keep wearing your masks. Wash those hands. Um, and go forth and love comics. Woo! Done it, done it. Done it, done it, done it, done it. Nice. Are you uh, caught up on WandaVision, Caleb? Yes, yeah. Yeah, that third episode was fire. Dude, I told Roger. I had to-